Okay, welcome to part two. Uh, I know it says episode five, but as we all know, episode five is part two. Uh, this is going to get a little bit more into algorithms than the last one did. The last video was more general concepts. This one's going to be almost no pictures and all words. I guess I just didn't have time to make animations for it, and I apologize. But uh, let's get into this, and then the third video will be a practical trick you can do with lots of animation, just explaining everything, and life will be great. Here we go. So when you're doing real software pipelining, not that kind of pretend thing that we were doing last time, uh, there are two families of algorithms. There's kernel recognition, which some people use, but I don't know that many things that use it. You're basically unrolling the innermost loop an unspecified number of times, and you're looking for a repeating pattern, which then becomes your loop body. I'm not going to get into the details on that one. Modular scheduling, which seems to be immensely more popular as far as I can tell, um, those are the ones that I'm going to go into. So you're going to find some minimal schedule that's going to represent a loop iteration. You're going to repeat this thing at constant intervals and hope that no constraints are violated and that everything just schedules out nicely and there are no conflicts and everything is great. Um, in IMS specifically, which is one modulo scheduling algorithm, uh, it requires a large data dependency graph and it explodes your register usage like a Death Star with an open exhaust port and you're flying at it with proton torpedoes. Okay, sorry, I'm getting off topic. It's also heavy. There's lots of dead ends, unscheduling, rescheduling, backtracking, forward tracking, crap we failed, go back, change something, go forward again, that kind of stuff. So Iterative modulo scheduling is the thing that I'm, I'm going to mainly be talking about, and it's characterized by uh, instructions can be scheduled and unscheduled several times before s finding a slot. So if you come to a dead end, you want to go back to some instruction, unschedule it, put it somewhere else, take the instruction that you couldn't schedule, put it in that new slot, and hopefully it works. Uh, there's swing modulo scheduling, which is way more lightweight, uh, doesn't do any backtracking, and is designed to reduce register pressure. And it's black magic re uh, relies on this sophisticated-ish kind of node ordering thing. Very cool. Uh, slack modulo scheduling is totally different from the other two. It's bidirectional, so it schedules from top to bottom, bottom to top. Um, and instead of prioritizing on things like dependencies and you know how many register or how many things are depending on you, it's prioritized by this concept of slack, which is like your freedom. How many, how your freedom to schedule it somewhere. So how much leeway do you have? Does it have to be somewhere? Or how much leeway do you have? I said that twice. Um, then there's stage scheduling, which isn't even a scheduling algorithm. It's more of a post pass that you use to reduce register requirements by uh, shifting instructions by a certain window. And that's called the II, and we'll talk about what that is later. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about automatons, uh, automaton, but they're really, really cool. Uh, it's one representation when you're implementing uh, this family of algorithms that you can use. It's this state vector, and it's kind of interesting. Exercise left to the reader, because I don't want to spend too much time talking about it. And I will talk about reservation table a little bit now. So reservation table is this thing that you see on the right. And if you do this on the SPU, this isn't exactly what the diagram will look like, but the concept remains. So you have a modulo reservation table where you schedule all your, all your instructions and you take one of these diagrams, overlay them on your schedule, and you check to see if any of the boxes conflict with any of the boxes that are already there. If the boxes conflict, you have a resource conflict, and you can't actually put this instruction there, so you have to try somewhere else. Um, it's just a really cool, I don't, I don't know what I would call it, not a notational thing, it's just, it's a cool way to, you know, check for resource conflicts and to verify that something can be scheduled at a particular place. All right, so terminology, I'm going to just talk about these first two uh, because they're the most important ones. Uh, the other two are important also, but uh, maybe I'll talk about them a little bit if I have time. So the initiation interval, this is probably the single most important thing in, uh, in scheduling, or at least I think it is. Um, it's the target length of your loop in instructions or slots that you have to schedule. Um, if you're scheduling things, and you fall off the end of it, you basically wrap around to the beginning and then look for the first open slot. And things that wrap around and then, you know, find a slot to schedule in, 
become things that go next iteration or ne are considered next iteration. Uh, the MII or minimum initiation interval is the initiation interval that is theoretically the shortest time you can have between loops and it's the maximum of the resource MII and the uh, recurrence MII. Now I, I could talk about these a little bit but I would rather just show you a trick that I use for um, for finding this and it's a I don't I didn't invent this this is totally common I think this just might be what everyone does. So here's our assembly code from the original uh, video if you remember that. Things with red arrows are even pipeline instructions and there seem to be six of them. Things with blue arrows are odd pipeline instructions and there are four. So if I had to take a guess as to what my minimum initiation interval would be or the window that I want to schedule things in, I would have to say six. And the reason is this. If you were to have a schedule that consisted of five slots, there is no way in the world that you could schedule six instructions into this thing that only has five slots. So it's basically the max of those two. And it's, um, it's super optimistic and it may or may not result in a totally workable schedule, but it's a really good place to start and I've never had any problems with it. So um, a couple data dependency types. The kind that you have to worry the most about is a true data dependency, which is read after write. So that's what we saw before in the original video that was calling, causing stalls, where the multiply was writing something out to a register and the store wanted to read in that value so it could it could store it to memory. I, I know that's a little bit weird saying the store wanted to read, but hopefully you, hopefully you know what I mean. Um, there's output dependencies, which is not really a, a real dependency, and that's just two instructions writing to the same location, which is right after write. And then there's anti-dependency, which you would think is like a totally great thing because dependencies are totally whack, and anything that's anti-dependency must be great. However, it turns out it's just an instruction using a location as an operand while a following instruction is writing into it uh, or write after read. Like I said, that also is not a real data dependency. They're both just storage conflicts. You can shuffle some registers around and get rid of it no problem. The thing you really need to worry about is the true data dependency because that's what's going to cause your stalls. Okay, here is some information about iterative modulo scheduling. Uh, this video is going to be in 1080p, so you're perfectly welcome to read it yourself. I'm not going to sit here and read the schedule, uh, read the um, the slide to you. However, the super important thing to note is that you're going to start off with this idea of your minimum window that you want to schedule things in, your initiation interval, and you're going to try to find a schedule. If you fail, you increase that window by one slot and then try again. And if you fail, you increase it by one and try again until you find something or you just give up entirely. However, every time you increment the, uh, mi increment the um, initiation interval by one, you're also decreasing loop parallelism. So one thing you could do to get around that is you could unroll before you schedule. And that actually enables this whole host of really, really cool optimizations that you could do that you absolutely, to the best of my knowledge, cannot do without unrolling first. So bottom of the slide if you want to take a look at it. It's just some information about how we decide what the priority of instructions are because you have to pick which instruction to uh, schedule first and the priority tells you what that is. So this is one out of many ways that you can actually schedule the instructions. Uh, once again, you know, feel free to read it at your leisure. It just goes into how we backtrack and unschedule things that were scheduled so that we could fit the new instruction in and you know, it's it's not the be all end all of algorithms. It's just one way that people tend to do this stuff. So it's if you're wondering how you can do it, this is one way and there's all kinds of variations.